So I just finished participating in the Design Science Studio uh, event hosted by the Buckminster Fuller Institute. And I'm gonna do something a little bit indulgent because uh, I was one of the speakers and it was just such an amazing event. Um, my presentation didn't load. So I ended up kind of winging it and talking sort of off the cuff. And I actually felt really excited about the content that I prepared and the story that I wanted to share. So I'm gonna record it anyway. I don't know where this will go, um, but I'm gonna give it a whirl. So uh, what happened in the event is that my screen share didn't work. And so um, I'm pretty sure I can get it to work here. I think I'm sharing right now. And I'm just gonna uh, go for it. And as if this is the live presentation. Um, so I was asked to talk about my work with art in relation to my uh, consulting. And um, so I decided to pull together a story that's a kind of range that talks about trees, string and running. So I'm originally from Toronto, which is known as Canada's largest city, but to me, it's known as a place of three river valleys. We've got the Rouge River in the east, we've got the Humber in the west, and I grew up in the ravine of the Don River in the middle of Toronto. So my sense of the city, although I was very much in the middle of the city in a very urban environment, is that of a lot of trees, a little river running very nearby, and I spent a lot of time playing in and amongst those trees. And that really gave me a sense of interest in trees. I was known to be hanging about in trees. This is a photo from 1977. I was picking mulberries from a berry tree very nearby to uh, my house. It was literally a, a 10 second walk from there. That's actually my neighbor, Heather, who was dangling from a branch uh, below. So it looks like we're one giant, which is why it caught the reporter's eye for the Toronto Sun that funny day. Um, and then later on, I came to be looking more closely at trees and sketching. This is a sketch from 1984, so I was about 13 years old. And it's not a particularly excellent sketch. I just share it to say that I, I was observing trees from a very early age. And I was also knitting from a very early age. This is probably from even earlier than 1977. Uh, I was probably about five or six here knitting a lot. And that was a habit that kind of persisted. Uh, here come the early 80s where I knit Icelandic sweaters. My mom and I knit Icelandic sweaters for the whole family. So I'm the one in the brown sweater sitting beside my mom. I made four and my mom made two. It's my sisters and brother and dad. Uh, it was the 80s after all. Um, and then another thing that really kind of marked me in the, the spirit of recognizing trees and the natural world around me was spending a year on exchange in Brazil. And uh, the high school that I attended in Brasilia went to the Amazon for uh, a round of classes for a little over a week. And this was our classroom uh, navigating up the Rio Negro, which is uh, one of the main tributaries to the Amazon River. And it's there that I learned about global warming in 1989. So that was a, a big kind of wake up and a sort of, wow, we, we got to do something about this. Wasn't too sure what that was going to mean. Um, I graduated from university, got my first real job working at WWF, which seemed like a good fit, my interest in nature and conservation. Um, and it was a great experience in many ways, although I felt we were sort of addressing the symptoms, not the cause. Uh, but my greatest memory of working at WWF was being mentored uh, by an amazing boss who's also a long distance runner. And she kind of recruited me into running. This is actually an image from uh, much more recently when I lived in New York City, where I lived for the last decade. Uh, but I, I show that to say that the running habit really became a very important part of my life. So trees, string, and running have been uh, sort of my art, my creative outlets. In terms of the work that I do, according to the outside world, I really have one purpose, which is to support the transition to the regenerative economy. And so a number of ways that I do that, that are sort of visible to the rest of the world. And, and that really looks like sustainability, reporting and transparency, working with a lot of mainstream, large publicly listed companies to help them uh, understand their impacts, environmental and social, produce transparent materials that people can understand what those impacts are, engage a diverse range of stakeholders and help them set more ambitious goals. And you could call that sustainability consulting. That's basically how I spend my time. I'm an independent uh, consultant and advisor. And there's a lot I could say about that. I'll circle back to um, the sort of problematic nature of working with essentially, I'm going to be blunt, the problem. So the extractive nature of these companies and the, the current economic model. And I don't take that lightly. I don't mean to glaze over and say I've got it all sorted. Um, but I'll take us through a little bit of a journey and, and come back to that in just a moment. Um, a little while 
after the, those terrible Icelandic sweaters uh, and my time at WWF in the mid nineties, I lived in New Zealand for a year and I, I tempt and then ended up getting pulled into a really interesting um, business that was growing very quickly in electronic engineering. So I went from the temp receptionist to uh, the manager of customer care and logistics because I speak a few European languages and their business was just mushrooming. It was an amazing experience in globalization, in uh, business, in leadership and in, in you name it, I, I learned a great deal. But what I really took away from New Zealand was even more of a habit with string. I was already dabbling with hand spinning then. I really got into it while I lived there. This is uh, me in a sweater actually that I knit right around the time of those Icelandic sweaters. I think I knit that one when I was about 12, not yet one of my own designs. Um, but uh, st still one of my favorites. And I'm spinning on a spinning wheel made in New Zealand, which has uh, that habit has stayed with me for a long time. Um, we moved back to Canada and uh, I worked in a few different spaces and including in a financial services institution, which just did not serve. I just did not understand why this model made sense. And I started to ask a lot of questions and didn't get satisfactory answers. And so after a little while of working with amazing people, I felt engaged and, and um, well compensated, uh, but it just did not make sense in terms of aligning with what the world meant to me and what the world was signaling to me. And so I walked away from that financial services job in 2003. Um, and it was at the time when the, the World Wide Web was kind of new-ish, there was no social media, but we had bulletin boards and there were a lot of spinning and weaving and knitting bulletin boards. And I saw a lot of really interesting activity going on across the country that I was interested in checking out. And so I just decided to buy an unlimited Greyhound bus pass and take a little spindle. I think my video, I think you can see my video here. So I'll trust it isn't just voiceover. I have a little spindle that is a way to produce yarn, very, very basic tool um, that sits on your lap, sat on my lap. And I decided to just travel across the country, spin yarn and just go with the flow a little and see what happened. And I didn't think that I was gonna make anything in particular. I thought maybe I'll just, I don't know, make a cushion cover or something really simple. Um, I had all the fiber I needed. I thought, you know, a bit of brown, uh, you know, complementary neutral colors. And I set out on this journey um, pointed west with a, a destination to get to Victoria where there was some family to visit. And on my way, I had a rule for myself, which is I won't uh, initiate conversation with a stranger on the bus, but if somebody initiates conversation with me, I'll jump in. And so my first overnight from uh, Sudbury, Ontario, I was uh, going over Lake Superior and getting to Winnipeg, Manitoba. And so it was a long journey. And I sat beside this lovely older woman named Sally, who tells me she's a grandmother. She's very interested in the knitting and the spinning that I seem to be doing on my lap. And she has this great idea for me. Why don't I knit the bus? And I thought that was a terrible idea because I'm not knitting the bus. I'm knitting neutral abstract things and maybe making a cushion cover. But when Sally fell asleep and I kept on spinning and knitting and looking out the window, um, I realized that she had a really cool idea. So I knit the bus. And then I ended up knitting a bunch of other things. Uh, won't take you through all 99 squares. There was a forest fire. There was a, a bride and groom. There's some hay bales. There's all kinds of stuff that ended my uh, trip that turned into quite a large blanket um, marking my trip from Toronto to Victoria and back in 2003. And that sense of really bringing squares together, bringing different disparate things that I didn't know I needed is a theme that's persisted. I've made a lot of blankets of squares. This is actually um, what we might call upcycling. These are um, uh, older spun and knit or woven garments. Uh, there's a bit of crochet in there too, that I um, that were rejects for one reason or another. They've been worn out or badly damaged or shrunken or whatever. And I kind of repurposed them into this uh, quilt where you kind of take some of the fabric aside and you reveal what's behind. So the back side of this looks like it's um, all knitted fabric or woven and um, the front are these diamonds. So this 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 blanket of squares idea is a theme that comes back for me over and over. And you might recognize that kind of upcycling as the circular economy, which is a huge topic with the clients and companies that I work with. What people don't really realize when they talk about the circular economy is it often gets described as recycling, but as anybody engaged in regeneration knows, it's far more than just, you know, re recycling some metal, glass, plastic, or paper. It's about designing waste and pollution out of all industrial systems. And I think all industrial systems belong in this conversation. This isn't just about farming and agriculture or agroforestry. It's every single industry that delivers on our needs. And if they cannot design out waste and pollution, 
and be part of regenerating natural systems, then the project of the regenerative economy is to help put those industries to bed in the most peaceful and uh, respectful way we can and allow those other industries to grow up and thrive. That's really what I see my work as doing. And I do see it happening. I don't mean to be Pollyanna. Uh, I'm actually deeply concerned about the pace, which isn't quick enough, and the lack of awareness in a lot of circles, but I do see real action. So Novellus is one of the large world to uh, world's largest aluminum products companies. Um, I've done some work with them over the years. Uh, none of the companies I will mention are, are current clients right now. Um, but I, I'm very impressed by their recognition that um, aluminum is, of course, infinitely recyclable. It is, when it's not recycled, it's made from bauxite and alumina, so mined minerals and the heat and energy required to create um, primary aluminum versus recycled is, is dramatically higher than when it's recycled. And so they made a commitment over 10 years ago to get to 80% recycled. They were well below 30% at that time. Um, and that is no small thing if we think about it, you know, and by the way, aluminum is probably in the device you're watching this on. Aluminum is, is you know, a lot of things more than the, the tin foil. It's the siding of uh, F-150 Ford pickup trucks. It's, it's a massive global um, uh, material. And so there's a lot of places to recover it from, but that's actually very complicated. It's not how their factories were initially designed. It's not how their engineers were initially trained. It's not how all of the uh, processes of the company had been conceived. So it's a massive reorientation of what we sort of take for granted in a day-to-day -day context. And, and they're actively working on it. It's, it's quite impressive. Their goal to get to 80% by 2020 was not achieved, but they did get close to 70, so dramatically further than they would have been without that goal. And they're still on their way. Another company that really inspires me and one I've had a chance to engage with over the years is Interface. They're, they're often a little reference sustainability and they've done pretty amazing things um, so lots to look at there what's really inspired me most recently along with their factory as a forest initiative which is worth taking a closer look at um, where they're seeking to have their factories function like forests and they've done a lot of work with the biomimicry folks not actually sure where that's at but before this talk I was trying to find out and I, I couldn't get more recent information so just didn't do enough homework there um, but something that is out there and easy to find information on is their um, recently launched, so it's right now it's November 2020, their recently launched um, climate positive carpet tile and it's flooring made with materials that sequester more CO2 than they emit. And the whole value web of the carpet tile is done in such a way that it is net sequestering. So. And um, that's partly just exciting generally, but it's also an amazing signal to the market. And they've been really active about engaging people outside of their industry and beyond just to, to indicate this is, this is possible in a wide range of products. And, and we see this in many, many places. I mentioned that I like to keep, uh, keep an eye on trees and trees have been signaling to me. I was walking near my, where I used to live in New York and this tree kind of caught my eye and this iPad sketch, which at that time I didn't know there was such thing as a stylus. So I just use my finger on my iPad um, and, and just take a closer look and try to listen to the sights and sounds around me. Running continued to be a habit. I'm still in Manhattan at the time of this photo and, and marathoning was a pretty key part of my life that's continued. Um, and that sense of wanting to understand the world around me, the trees, liking to go for a run, took me to Ethiopia on a couple of different trips, um, really just kind of following my nose a little bit and trying to understand what was happening. I didn't know my friend that I was uh, walking in the highlands with was taking this picture of me apparently imitating a tree, really just doing some stretches after a run. Uh, and this is beautiful landscape up in the Simeon Mountains um, in the highlands of Ethiopia. And in many ways, it is spectacular. It's like a Grand Canyon in terms of its scope. I, I just skimmed, I'm not including a lot of images here. But what I started to realize is actually in the distance there, you see um, barley fields. And this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site that is devastatingly deforested. And I'm standing in a place here where not long before was forest, like 15 years ago, it was forest. So this is actively happening now. It's really difficult to see that, to have the trees kind of signal, the absent trees were sort of signaling this to me as I walked and listened and learned among some of the folks who live there. And yet at the same time, this photo is from within Addis Ababa, the largest city there, <clears throat> excuse me, where this is an incredible mecca of this very particular spot of local food production, of education, of medicinal plants. It's an amazing experimental zone. It is in the middle of the city, right beside a very polluted river and a slum and all kinds of stuff that when you're heading towards it, you think, oh my goodness, where are we possibly going? And then you get here 
and it is a haven. And so this was a great reminder to me, the time that I spent there, that on the one hand, we've got this pattern of devastation, and we've also got this pattern of evolution, of emergence, of listening and sensing and learning. So it was a great, great experience for me. Trees have continued to talk to me. This is in a eucalyptus plantation in Brazil. Uh, I've done a fair bit of work with the forest products industry there. And most people would not cite uh, forest products in Brazil as you know the folks that are gonna save us. I'm, I'm not a fan of monoculture. This was a difficult place to stand. It was almost silent, did not hear a bird, hectares and hectares of, of plantation. Um, and at the same time, what I see many of these companies doing is trying to understand the opportunity for regeneration. And so that's a, that's a longer story I'd tell another time, but um, what also happened in Brazil and I go back and forth a bit for work. And so while I'm there, I try to follow my nose and find um, examples of regenerative business models or case studies that I can listen and listen to and, and learn from and share. And this is one I've written about it on my blog and there'll be a link at the end of um, this presentation. And I'll try to remember to put in the, the um, description here too, but this is the Legado das Aguas uh, Orchidaria, the greenhouse where the orchids are, and the whole business model is predicated on generating financial value by preserving biodiversity. So much more I could say there. I've, I've written up some, some information about it because I think it's just an amazing example of a business model that is regenerative versus a company trying to kind of tweak what it's doing to be less degenerative. So it's examples like that that I'm on the hunt for and the trees kind of guide me there and running around a bit gets me there too. Uh, I grew some cotton on my windowsill a few seasons while I lived in Manhattan. So this is a view looking out of our ninth story window and this is a cotton bowl forming. I was able to spin the cotton into some yarn, still kind of considering what I might do with it. Um, so again, the plants and, and the string, it all sort of comes together to tell me what to do with it. I mentioned uh, when I said what I do with companies, you know, trying to think about transparency, engagement, et cetera. A lot of that is, I'm brought in as an advisor and I do this work with companies, but I see a lot of things that don't quite work and I try to tell the truth about it. And so a lot of my external work, my visible work, which isn't that much, and I'm not that visible, um, but I try to really be brutally honest about what I think needs to happen. And sometimes it's not very comfortable. And I've said some things that have uh, caused a little bit of difficulty. And yet I'm heartened by the fact that I'm asked back that many of the companies that I work with and the collaborators that I work with in the corporate space, I've been working with for years, sometimes um, over a decade. And I continue to see this sort of emergent awakening and appetite to understand. And these are just a couple examples of blog posts that I uh, created to try to share a bit more about what I was seeing and feeling and how to signal around the need to really shift business models and industrial systems. Running has um, increased as a habit. I signaled when I mentioned the marathoning that that's continued. And I've, I've had this sense for a long time that we actually have so much more potential than most of us give ourselves permission to realize. And uh, running for me is an example of that. I've, I've long dreamed of running an ultra marathon. I was able to uh, realize that dream just a couple of weeks ago in October. Even though the event itself was canceled, a lot of the runners, we just created our new, um, our own routes. So I ran about a 90 kilometer route, to, uh, give or take 55 miles along the St. Lawrence River. And it was really about engaging in dialogue with, dialogue's the wrong word, engaging in a listening and experiencing exercise, understanding how we've reshaped the riverbanks, how we've um, dismantled the natural forests that are there and then watching what comes back. And I, I did some, I didn't really realize I was gonna do this, but I ended up making a quirky little movie about it as I went. So I'll make sure that's linked there too. Um, really just an amazing opportunity to be present among the world that we're creating and, and imagine what it could possibly be. And so that running, the, the chatting with trees, that string play continues. The Blanket of Squares project is always on the go. This is one that I'm uh, just about finished actually as, as I was watching the Buckminster Fuller uh, salon that just happened, I got even closer to the end. So just about to put the final triangle on here and wrap this up for a dear friend of mine. So that's about it. Um, links and gratitude here. And I really appreciate the opportunity to pull this content together. So I went out on a bit of a twig, even though my presentation didn't work in real time and created this one here. Hope, uh, hope you don't mind. <laughs>